On this week's episode of Devil's Trap Podcast, Bobby makes us check ourselves and wrecks ourselves. <laughs> Let's do this. This week's episode of Double Strap Podcast. Hi, I'm Diana. I'm Liz. And this week we're uh, avoiding talking about season seven, episode ten, uh, Death's Door. Because it's depressing as fuck. It is. It is very emotional. It's very beautiful. It's amazing. Fuck this episode. Okay, so how are all the things? How are you? What's going on with I'm you? I'm good. Okay, I'm just had you know some very good news at work this week and um you know I'm just getting ready for my car show <laughs> that will probably be over but we'll be releasing this right when it's about to happen so invasioncarshow.com uh and uh i'll be uh, in nashville for a few days coming up so yeah it's just a busy time but good stuff cool cool no i think this will be released on the 20 the right before the weekend so you can get yes your, 21st yeah so you can have your if you're listening to this like like one of our 12 people that listen to him the first day, like, yeah, you should go to D Ballin and go to the invasion car show. There's yeah, a pen up. It's free. For there's a free, so. there's a pen up girl contest. There is. Yeah. See how all the things I know about your car show cars and cars, there's, there's cars, vendors. there's, you know, the walking around and D Ballin. And then there's going to be yeah. an after party and there's a band that's playing. There is. I don't remember the band that's playing, but there's a band that's playing. masks. <laughs> Luchador oh, uh, Little Straight Jackets is playing. <laughs> See? Because you wanted to know what the inside their mask smells like. That's right. That's right. <laughs> well, yeah. So, no. It's just been good. How about you? I am. Let's see. This weekend, I think my exciting thing is the Paranormal Fest that's happening tomorrow that I have not gotten a ticket for. So, um, I'm going to, you know, figure out a way to get inside. You'll get, you'll get there. I think my favorite, my favorite thing is like, I will just tell them that the ghosts will not haunt them anymore if they don't let me in. And I feel like that's the yeah. appropriate threat, right? Because you can't like threaten them with ghosts because they would be like, the thank you, they'll like, right? Bring, they'll be, bring it on. Yeah. But if there's a bunch of like travel channel, like you people who do like the ghost hunter shows and like battle demons or whatever the fuck they do. I don't know. But it's also like the anniversary of the battle of Salado Creek. So apparently it's a very active time at this place. So mm-hmm. maybe there will be a haunted I don't know. Maybe a ghost will fill me up this time because this is a place that this is that Victoria's Black Swan in. So that's the one that's got the carriage house that has the pervy ghost oh. that yeah, likes to like you? that likes to fill you up. So maybe I'll get some action. Get felt up by a ghost. Hey, at least like something will touch my boobs, right? You know. Uh, so on that note this is death's door and if you can't figure out what that means sorry uh this is season seven episode 10 this first aired december 2nd 2011 it was directed by robert singer was written by sarah gamble so we've got some like you know we've got the showrunner and like the their favorite director on this right so because it's very heavy very emotional (laughs) It's just, yeah. it's just, it's a very, it's, it's lovely. There, however, which I think in order to make this like great, there was a deleted scene that I, I found on the transcript for this and I was very upset because it was another time for our favorite character, Susan, to shine. So mm-hmm. apparently what, ha- what happened is after Dick Roman shoots at Bobby, Susan comes up to him and he tells her it's a nice night, isn't it? And Susan goes, mm-hmm. and Dick Roman goes, but then every night is compared to home. And then Susan fixes her hair. Ooh. Dick Roman says, you look a little windswept. And then Susan says, that hunter with the beard shot me in the face. 
So Bob, we took Bobby shot Susan. So we, she had a moment here. And then Dick tells her, well, then I think I just returned the favor. End of the day, you want to reach your goal. You got to hoe your own row. Even if you get your hands a little dirty, have Marco bring my car around. And so then he basically makes Susan be his bitch and order his car. Um, so Susan, we still need to talk about your goals and how you like let authority walk all over you. I understand that he is your boss, but there are some things that are unacceptable. He can order his own goddamn car. You don't know their work dynamic. They may have an agreement. They may. Don't judge. Don't judge. I think they, I just have a bad taste. Like, remember when it, like, I worked for somebody and I had to order their car all the time and I had to take my ass, like, on the subway all the way back to Brooklyn. It, like, was, like, fr- freaking out because Metro costs, like, a dollar. And she's like, get my town car so I don't have to walk three blocks. So, sorry. I, I, I don't know where that came from. Su- huh. Susan Susan brings out something in me. She just does. <laughs> I notice. So I'm going to comment. I'm really disappointed that that scene isn't in this because I think there's a critical component, a line in there about how it's better. Any day here is better than a day at home. Yeah. So that is super telling. Like I had, this is my first time hearing that, that scene. And for me, I think that that's very enlightening as to the motivation of the Leviathans because we're learning now the Leviathans aren't after, you know, taking over and eating all the people just because they're fucking assholes. They're taking over because this is because they don't want to be back where they were in purgatory because purgatory is awful. Which I mean, I kind of get. I mean, we also kind of get they were trapped there, but at the same time, like nobody ever talked about like what's it like there, guys. Like nobody's asked. Nobody asked Dick Roman what it was like there. Nobody asked Chet. Yeah. They just fucking got mad. They at just them. assumed, you know, they don't know. They don't know they why. They assume they're pure evil, which, I mean, I don't yeah. know. But I mean, what so is their that motivation? they force people to like eat, eat themselves, whatever, you know, so That's their own. It, yeah, it's they awful. eat themselves. Like I told you last time, you didn't have to. You could have said no, Chuck. Uh, so, but I do think one of the reasons they probably cut it out was just because the shot of the bullet in Bobby's head yeah. is, oh, is so cool. very compelling. <laughs> It is very compelling. Although they could, so I understand. Yeah, that too. they could. They could have done both. I think they could. Honestly, they, they could have because they could have done like the supernatural break after that. But they, yes. but then they actually end up doing the bullet thing twice. So maybe it was that they Which wanted I, that, to do it twice. Yeah, I guess. Yeah, because that's what we get is a zoom out of the bullet hole in Bobby's head while Dean's yelling and driving and Sam trying to keep Bobby alive, and then we zoom back into the bullet hole into Bobby's head right after the break. So, yeah. Um, so, I mean, I guess they could have done like they could have done that after the break and had yeah. just the whole like thing go through. But I think it's a lot. It was a lot more powerful having it broken up. I agree. I agree. So we are in a forest now inside Bobby's head uh, with Sam, Dean and Bobby. And they find Phil again, like from the previous episode. And Bobby's like, our, well, shit. So- our human burrito. <laughs> <laughs> and uh bobby knows something bad's about to happen because there's blood dripping from his head onto his hand or that something bad already happened yeah. but um and and it kind of just this is where this episode just starts jumping it is a scene jumping fool yeah. and it makes sense as we get through why it is but right now you're kind of like the fuck yeah and one <clears> thing <throat> is that you know, and we prepare, I've been obviously been preparing on this, building up to this for the past few episodes, and I've been building Diana up to this. Yeah. Uh, in order for me to watch this, I actually found out that on the DVD, there was commentary by Jim Beaver and Stephen Williams, and Stephen Williams is the actor who plays Rufus. So that is how I watch the episode. And usually if there's commentary, I'll watch it like once without and like once with, but no. No, Not I just I just watched it like with the episode and the transcripts and kind of went back and forth. So I can tell you some things as we're going through, which will hopefully lighten the stuff. Because honestly, having the two of them talk about it like lightened it up and also kind of brought a little bit more to it. So one of the things that I learned was that they shot this scene at the same time that they shot the last episodes Ooh. because that because if you think about it, you're in a forest is expensive. Yeah, go back to the same yeah, like, wardrobe and you like... keep the same light and all the other things, right? Mm-hmm. So they shot this at the same time as last one. But I always kind of like that stuff. <laughs> Just knowing that. That is interesting. Yeah. And so we cut now we're back at their their most recent squat house, flop house whatever you want to call it. 
and Bobby's now he's like knows some things were really wrong and because and they're like Sam and Dean are just kind of like oblivious and he's like I got shot in the head uh and I know this is not the real world and I have to tell you something but I have to tell the real you something but but at least he understands right at least we don't have to deal with like a whole like Bobby like going through thinking yeah but no, like so at least they cut that part of it out this is, yes I agree yeah. So he finds a piece of paper, writes a number in Sharpie on it, and f- shoves it in his pocket because he didn't have time to tell them before. And it's 454895. Hmm. That's her number. Hmm. But we don't get an explanation. Yeah. Um, and so now, and then the scene flips again because, like Diana said, like yeah. stuff just like keeps flipping around in here. So we flip and we get a woman, and it's Karen, and she's wearing my favorite outfit a white nightgown. And she's she's looking a little like she's she's being a little provocative, and uh, asks him to hand it over. Okay, ma'am, but she meant the wine. Also, um, agree, Karen. <laughs> like you for this. Yes, agree. Same page. Yeah, appreciate it. But and um, and and basically, Bobby remembers this uh, that when this happened, and uh, he's you know just really reliving his the first this this event occurring with Karen, where it was a very sexy type of moment. That she wants to talk to him. And uh, and then there's thunder, and then it gets Lightning. dark, but it's clear outside. And so, and Bobby sees a kid running from like the shed outside, as like blackness is surrounding the outside. It's very metal. This sounds very metal, like everything you're describing. It does, <laughs> and I like Mother Mary. I've got a messed up fruitcake. <laughs> Oh, and also something else I learned is this is, and it makes sense, but I never thought about it. This is the first time you see the upstairs of Bobby's house. And then, oh, weird. and something else that Beaver points out later in the commentary, which I also didn't think about is I think they like take, they took down Bobby's house because it burned down. Oh, yeah. And so they uh, had to rebuild it. <laughs> <laughs> didn't do this and but then Stephen williams kind of chimed in he was like he was very happy about it because that meant like they were like that they were using rufus's cabin which meant there was a chance he was going to come back yeah yeah so um we uh we get another scene jump and now rufus and um uh, and bobby are outside and Rufus is kind of like coaching Bobby on like being a hunter, it sounds like, as they're getting ready to go into this church wearing press control uniforms. But Bobby's trying to explain to Rufus that I'm going to die. I'm going to die. I have to talk to you. I'm going to die. And Rufus <laughs> is like, well, that's just a negative attitude about this job. Come on. It's pretty, it's like painful, but oh, funny how this, and this continues between them. Um, and uh, we see this small kid run up again. This kid runs by and then just pops back up and uh, tells Bobby, God's going to punish you. What? A small child running up that and down the street. so upsetting. Yes. Very upsetting. <laughs> you know. Very upsetting. I don't think anybody should ever hit a child. I think that is empirically wrong or whatever. Like, it's very wrong. Core beliefs. However, if a child runs up to me and says, God is going to punish you, I can't help but think my instinct is probably going to be to pop that child in the face. Yeah, I mean, I'm kind of with you on that one. And you're, just, you're going to feel really bad, but that's just like, because this is un- unsettling. Yeah, and as this happens, we hear a bro- sound of broken glass, and we see a glass of bro- a, a broken glass with milk on the ground. Spilled It's just milk. weird, because we're yeah. like, we're like in the doorway of a church. Yep. So Bobby goes into the church with Rufus and there's a five person choir mm-hmm. that starts disappearing while an earthquake starts. It's <laughs> my description. It's pretty good. It's pretty good. And then it gets dark and a man with a pocket watch appears and says, time's up. Oh, so now we've met Bobby's Reaper. Very, he, he is very dapper looking reaper he's a he's a younger he, he didn't get one of the elderly ones he got a kind of like a middle-aged reaper yeah. good, good for you bobby i mean and he's snarky he's snarky he's a little snarky he, a little snarky he's got a pocket watch i appreciate that um but what we figure out from this is that bobby is in a coma yes so we're going to break up sadness already, um, and we're going to play a game. Girlfriend's in a coma. It's serious. 
dun, dun, dun. I don't know. That's just the title I came up with this because I want to sing that song sometimes. So what we're going to do, this is basically two truths and a lie. We've done this before. Mm -hmm. So two of these are real stories about people in comas, or at least they are real according to Listverse and Robert Grimnick's 10 amazing stories of people who woke up from comas. However, one was written by one of my AI boyfriends. Yes, I have many. Don't judge me. I can be slave for AI. Yeah. It's fine. <laughs> All right. So you ready for this? Sure. All right. Your first one, D.B. Ferris. In the chilly winter of 2015, D.B. Ferris, a lively 45-year-old music producer, su suffered a severe case of meningitis that landed him in a coma for nearly a month. After spending weeks in unconsciousness, Ferris woke up with a peculiar yet profound fascination for classical music, particularly Mozart, a total tune from a change of tune from his former love for indie rock and grunge. The sounds of Mozart's symphonies filled him with an unexplainable sense of peace and tranquility. This new phase was particularly surprising for those who knew Ferris well. Before the coma, Ferris was a known name in the indie rock scene, having worked with several, several popular bands and artists. But post-coma, his interest took an unexpected detour towards orchestral compositions, causing a bit of a stir among his circle. Despite the initial shock and confusion, Ferris embraced the strange twist of fate. He began spending hours listening to the compositions of Mozart, never thought of before the coma. Although the sudden shift in his musical taste left his friends and family puzzled, Ferris Clinton and I are in the line, whatever. So basically, like, he liked Mozart. All right, so that's the first one. It was right. D.B. Ferris. He likes Mozart now. All right, so the second one is Sam Carter. In 2008, 60-year-old retired baker Sam Carter had fallen into a coma from severe anemia, which occurs when a blood person when a person's red blood cell count gets too low or the blood lacks hemoglobin. Globin? 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 Oh. No, it's a fun word to always. In, in the hospital in Staffordshire, England, Carter had been in a coma for three days and he was given a 30% chance of recovering. The doctor suggested to his wife that she should play some music for him. His wife got a set of headphones and put them on her husband, playing the Rolling Stones classic, I Can't Get No Satisfaction. Amazingly, once the song was played, Sam opened his eyes. Sam says that the song gave him a new energy and pulled him out of the coma. He doesn't remember much from the coma, but he remembered hearing that song. The song also had special meaning to him and was the first single he had ever bought when he was 17 years old. He said it gave him the push he needed to wake up. So Sam can't get no satisfaction. That's the second one. All right, the third one, Sarah Thompson. In early 2012, 32-year-old Sarah Thompson got a blood clot on her brain blood clot on her brain and it ultimately led to her being in a coma for 10 days when she awoke she thought it was the year 1998 she thought that her favorite band the spice girls were still together and she didn't know michael jackson was dead more importantly, she didn't recognize her children or her husband. In 1998, Thompson was 19 years old, had just given birth to her first son, and that was and was still with her ex. So when her children came in, she was expecting that her eldest would be a baby. Instead, he was 14 years old. She didn't even remember the other two children. As for her husband, she thought he was someone who worked at the hospital. Outside of the hospital, Sarah acted like a teenager. She threw tantrums and was rebellious. She listened to loud rock music and dyed her hair wild colors. She said it took a while, but she's readjusting to her life and has re-fallen in love with her husband. So that is, I want to zig a zig a zig a zig a uh, Sarah Thompson. So we have D.B. Ferris and Mozart. Sam Carter and I can't get no satisfaction and Sarah Thompson and Michael Jackson's dead or alive, I guess. Ah! Uh, I'm going to go with Sarah is the lie. No, it was D.B. Ferris. What? Yeah, Sarah's legit for real. And so was Sam. That's 
That's kind of terrifying. That what they see that they have the coma or the AI. Both. Well, I fed but like that. Th- they're not remembering people like that, like the amnesia shit. That's right, so but like that's freaky. Like fourteen years, like oh my gosh. Well, I mean, it's kind of just like one long like alcohol blackout. <laughs> I don't know if that's an optimistic way to look at it. I mean, it's relatable. But I it's- mean, I'm glad that she, but also like she stayed with her husband. Like that's cool. That's a good sign. But that was yeah. 2012. I don't know. We should probably look at this Miss Thompson and see what she did because she was 32 in 2012, and it's 2023. So she's like 45 now. It's only it's wild. Yeah, it's wild. So, ah, uh, that's just interesting. But yeah, so that's weird. Shit happens in comas. I didn't like they were all about music. I did too. I noticed. I noticed. Okay. Do we have, we have to go back? Right. Okay. Oh. All right. So our our new Reaper calls uh, Bobby's the inside of Bobby's head a gin soaked rat maze, which we all know would be rocket whiskey soaked, not gin soaked. I know, it's weird to be gin. I'm like, why is it gin? It's like I've never seen a big gin. What the fuck never. are you talking about? But either way. And so then Bobby runs and we get another scene where where Bobby is watching Sam and Dean setting up in the living room for movie night, arguing about whether Chuck Norris can beat up Jet Li. And um, just for the record, uh, Stephen Rufus thinks that Jet Li would win. Um, I also agree if Chuck Norris is five foot tall, Jet Li would kick his ass. Is Jet Li tall? Taller. Also, what the fuck happened to Jet Li? I don't know. Did Chuck and Chuck Norris is alive? Yes. Okay, his water. It was like I buy his water, but I don't know if he's alive. Yeah. He's alive. Okay. Anyway, so you buy his you buy his water? I have before. It's a, does it round kick your thirst? It does. It's it round kicks my thirst into its place. Or roundhouse kicks, whatever. You know, you know what I meant. Anyway, yeah. so Bobby goes to get uh beers in the kitchen. And as he's walking to the kitchen, he, he, the kitchen's all different because his mom is there telling him to get washed up because dad will be mad. Mom! And this is the first time we ever see Bobby's mom. Bobby's mom. It so is. we know we're getting a lot of backstory on Bobby here. We've never gone this, this far deep into Bobby. So he closes the doors to the kitchen and then now he's back with Rufus working a case uh, and, um, he's begging Rufus still to help him because he's like, I'm in a coma. I need your fucking help. And Rufus just won't listen. And it's too busy about to, too busy busting up crips. I love this ghost story though. So the ghost story is that the girl got left at the altar. Then she committed suicide. Then she gets buried in the church. And now she's going after men who break girls hearts. Yes. Hot. I love it. I, I love this for her. You do. I also, I also appreciate Rufus's earring. So Stephen uh, said that he loved it because he wears two earrings in his normal life. So he, oh. this is one of his. Like, he was like, I got to, got to wear like one of my earrings. So, That's cool. Yeah, isn't that fun? And we finally get a scene back in the hospital in the real world. So now we know what's happening in real time is Bobby's being frantically wheeled in on a stretcher in the ER and Sam Dean are running along and get kicked out of the room so they can stabilize. So the doctors can stabilize. it. And apparently a lot of those people were actual like medical personnel. Really? Interesting. So back in the crypt, Rufus gets this coffin open. (laughs) You like that back in the crypt. Uh, and Bobby's like, fuck this. I'm out. You're not helping me. But as soon as he turns around, we have our ghost and she calls Bobby a heartbreaker, grabs Cut his gun out of his chill. hand, <laughs> grabs his gun out of his hand and shoves her hand into his fucking chest. Ugh. And she's squeezing his heart and he is suffering, which translates into the real world where we get shots of Bobby crashing in the er trauma center whatever the fuck it is um but right uh, luckily rufus uh comes around and hits the ghost and makes it poof away for a second but then rufus gets thrown and now he's bleeding from the head and it's not very helpful so but luckily bobby torches the corpse like you do so uh but because of this because the ghost was no longer squeezing bobby's heart now in the real world he's stabilized but he is unconscious and hooked up to a lot of machinery. Yeah, and there's still back and forth happening. It's a lot of back and forth. But 
basically, this is the job that Rufus almost got, almost died on before. And this is the scene where we're like, just really, it's a wait and see in the real world for Bobby's stability. And then all of a sudden, Bobby's outside and sees the stupid kid again and tries to call to him, but the kid just stares at him. And then we all, then a nurse wheels Rufus out. We were outside of a hospital. It ends up. He's alive. He's alive. So Rufus is back and gives the nurse his phone number because Rufus is a playa. Just kidding. Yeah. Just kidding. And Steven said that this was like a really happy episode for him because he really wanted to be brought back. And so he was just like, haha, even though like he was like I'm dead and like, but now like he was like, this is like start the start of the campaign to bring Rufus back. He's just a delightful person. And him and Jim uh-huh. Beaver talking to each other, like it just like it was like a like like watching this with somebody with like a sweater wrapped around you and just being like, It's okay. You can make it through this. Yeah. Well, Bobby starts picking Rufus's brain and finally Rufus really finds kind of grasps that he's inside Bobby's head and Bobby needs his help to figure out how to get the fuck out of this situation out of his own head. And so Rufus gives him the tips about like, Hey, I, yeah, I was in a coma and I almost crossed over, but yeah, she's got to go through doorway after doorway. And uh, every doorway is another chapter, the good, bad, and the bloody, as he says, and you have to go real fucking deep, not real old, but to the shit that <laughs> the shit you don't want to think about. Yeah. You got to go the stuff that you bury the, the stuff that you don't want to think about so badly that you bury it and shove other crap over it. It's yeah. Like, like the stuff the that like, memory. if you do like ketamine, you're supposed to think about like, Oh, gross. but it's a, basically it's a, it's the, a psychiatric treatment. That's, that's popular now that is apparently working. Oh. Um, anyways, so we'll talk about that later. So, but um, yeah. basically, the, yeah, the way the way out is through your worst memory is the long and short of it. And so, Bobby's like, "Great, I got to get these numbers to Sam and Dean, no matter what." And um, so, I need your help to do this. And so, Bobby's got to figure out what his worst memory is. And like, as the ground is shaking, like he tells Rufus that he needs his partner. And Rufus asks a very pointed question. Why did that ghost call you a heartbreaker? I thought you were kind of a family guy. So now we're back in the upstairs bedroom at Bobby's house. And there's a broken wine glass on the floor. And uh, Karen tells Bobby that she hates him. Ooh. Yeah. Yeah, this ain't good. This is awkward. I don't like watching it's this. It's a very upsetting scene. I don't either. But long story short is, because I'm not going to... I guess TLDR. Is she's mad and says their entire life and marriage is a lie because she thought they were going to have a family. And now he says that he doesn't want to have kids. Um, and why didn't he tell her that sooner than because he, he had told her that everything uh, you break, everything you touch. And then she steps in the broken glass. Ow, ow, ow. As someone who has, who has been having a lot of foot pain lately, I feel you, Karen. Like, that sucks. I'm so sorry you stepped in the glass. What did you, yeah, also, fuck you, Bobby. If you guys talked about it before, or you told her before you get married that you were going to have kids, and then all of a sudden now you're like, I don't want to have kids. But also, like, people change and grow, Karen. Like, you know, people, like, sometimes we want things and then we want different things, you know, and, like, that's part of relationships. And now it's your it time. It's like a bad communication. Yeah, now it's time for you to sit down and go, what do we do with this information right like how do do we want to stay together can we separate like what do we do like you don't have to go to this dark place karen you don't but now bobby's like been going into late bye (laughs) yeah he's so bobby's out and uh but he tells he's he said that he never stopped being sorry and rufus is just confused he's like i always thought you wanted kids like the fuck and um find out that uh karen got possessed three days after this argument took place so they never really got to like a full reconciliation which is sad dark and and bobby shares that that fight was the biggest the biggest regret of his life was it he said you think it was when i had to stab her to death but then i was thinking about about that even then i was only thinking about how we never got past this yeah no it's fucking depressing all right fine whatever go into the light so yeah, they're going toward the light, but now it's somewhere around 1989 
And Bobby makes an Eternal Sunshine reference, and they're watching a younger B- Bobby with a uh, child, Dean, playing, they're throwing a baseball in a park, even though B- Dean asks about gun practice. Bobby's like, no, we're going to do kid shit at the park. Yep. And uh, Bobby is in a turtleneck and should never, ever be in that again. Um, (laughs) But Bobby tells Rufus that, you know, his dad was a mean drunk and he didn't want to end up like him. Yeah. So he didn't want to have kids because he didn't, he was too scared of being like his dad. That's why he didn't want one. So we go through another door and we see mom, we're back in the kitchen. Mom's serving dad dinner and the, the kid, so now the creepy kid from earlier, oh shit, it's not just a creepy kid, that's little Bobby. He runs in and- He's still a creepy uh, kid. He is still a creepy kid. And dad is obviously drunk and is very mean. And uh, when little kid Bobby knocks a glass of milk onto the floor and shatters, the exact same thing we saw at the church. Dad tells him, you break everything you touch. Mm. So that now we know where Bobby got that in his head, where he told Karen that. And it's just painful. It's very sad. It is painful. It is gut punching painful. I hate it. Because it tells you that's something that he just carried. And that's just awful. And then what's even worse, though, is like as shitty as all of this is, like Bobby's like, this is just a Tuesday. This is like he's like this just a Tuesday. Dad throws his plate on the floor to just and takes you know takes a swig of his liquor while mom's trying to clean things up, and Bobby's just like shrugging it off and walks out. He's like, yeah, I'm gonna go stop the Reaper. This is just a normal night. This isn't really my trauma that I need to worry about. And that's so sad that this is not your trauma, or is it? Uh, I don't know. It's fuck it. Fuck. I hate it. Okay. So next we go to, um, the, the doctor telling the boys things that seem positive ish. They're just like, ish. they're just like, you know, like there's some positive things. We don't know. We just have to hold on. Mm-hmm. And then there's this other guy kind of lingering about and he's the organ donation guy. And Dean is not the person that he needs to be talking to. No, Dean just all. loses his shit and you just don't. I mean, I kind of get, like, that's a... Uh, I get it. It's a touchy subject, and uh, but also, like... I get it, too, though. There's there's a timeline on these things. It's very... It's just a oof. It just seems so, like, morbid and, and not... Uh, it seems very unoptimistic at that time. It's hard. Yep. But either way, so Dean's pissed, punches the fuck out of, the, of a sign instead of the guy's head, that's luckily, good. which is yeah. very close. And then storms outside where he sees a black car, town car... And good old Dick Roman is sitting in the town car grinning at him. That's, that's just that's probably not the right thing. That's messed up, Dick. It's a dick move, it's Dick. It's a dick. Yeah. It's a dick move. And all these people kind of start gathering around with their cameras, though, once they realize Dick Roman's in the car. Because he's because Dean is not being quiet about this. No. And starts yelling at him and telling him. Come like, at me, bro. <laughs> yeah. Come at me, bro. And, uh, and he, Dick Roman laughs at him. And Dean's calling out, like, all these people are filming. Come on, let's do it, you know. And Dean calls him out when he's laughing. He says, you're only laughing because you're scared or you're stupid. And Dick Roman actually stops laughing. He, like, he still kind of has, like, a smirk, but he's, like, he actually, like, gave him pause. I'm like, okay, Dean, if you struck a nerve. Well, and this is, like, the thing, like, and it's, a, it's kind of like Winchester's versus Big Bad stuff, right? And it's like where the yeah. Big Bad at first is, you know, kind of like, haha, these are just like stupid human boys. Just stupid humans, yeah. And then like, there's like, wait, is there something I should actually be concerned about? Because for some reason they're doing... Well, get, and also like, why why isn't he, why isn't Dean dead yet, right? Like, yeah, this is like exactly. such an easy thing, like, you know, so... So back in Bobby's head, he's in his he's in his house and he's looking through his books and he tells Rufus about how you can't really stop the Reaper, but you can slow him down because Sam and Dean picked up some tricks along the way, and he's got a Bible with a giant cutout inside with this really awkwardly large rosary in it, which apparently was a a very big pain in the ass prop to work with, and like the cross to get to like getting like the chain would get tangled up, the cross would get stuck. And like, look at the way that's cut out; like it's huge. Yeah. And try to get that out of like that book shape thing. Yeah, that was yeah. probably, but it's so cool. Good job. <laughs> yeah, it's cool. Yeah. And back in the hospital, Dean and Sam have a quick, you know, just a quick exchange. It's honestly not even like that much of one, but other than they, they know that 
Dean shares what that guy wanted being an organ or he didn't even tell him about being organization organ donation guy. He says he was an insurance dude. Uh, but he tells Sam that Dick's outside. Um, we find out from the nurse that swelling's down a little and his, and Bobby's breathing on his own. It's a best case scenario. Um, but they can't try to take the bullet out yet. And Sam wants to talk about what to do if Bobby dies and Dean is not going to have that conversation. Yeah, so I sum up this whole scene in like three sentences. All right, no. the boys fume. Sam tries to get Dean to face the reality that Bobby might die. Dean doesn't want to face it. Then Sam gives himself a hand job. He did what? He gives himself a hand job because he's sitting there like like holding on to like his like Satan hand. hand, like trying to like keep I guess Satan at bay, right? Because this whole time too, like you just assume he's holding his hand. You, like every hand. time like Sam does this, that means that Lucifer is there. Which is like some Ooh. severe mental shit. If you're thinking about it, right? So Sam is like trying to keep. You're right because that's he would always hold the wound, and that was how his connection to reality. Whoa! So because Sam's brain is still fucked up. Probably. This has yeah. not been fixed. No, no, no. He's just living with it. He's just living with it. So, like, this is, like, extra super, like, human power Sam. Because he is keeping his shit together while his father figure is dying. And trying to keep his brother in check while Lucifer is, like, doing something. That's really dark. Right? It got dark. How did this get darker? How did they make it darker? Oh, my God. Well, I made it darker. Oh. But... Well, I know, but still. <laughs> it's like, All right. what so... I do. <laughs> I know. Well, Bobby and Rufus are in Bobby's living room making this shit to slow down the, the Reaper. And, uh, they, but Bobby still needs some ingredients. And now he's like walking through the house and he's noticing things are missing. And he's also like getting a weird, he walks in on another memory where he sees himself talking on the phone to John and John's being a dick. And then, he gets a jar of red liquid out of the fridge and paints a sigil on the floor. <laughs> like that's. Yeah. Well, what's funny is, you know, like, so like, I'm just like, you know, but young Bobby's on the phone with the world's shittiest father who wanted Dean to be shooting a rifle and not playing catch because he sucks. And he's Bobby's painting a, a sigil on the floor. Uh, but Jim Beaver, like uh, the commentary is going was like, don't you keep blood in your fridge? And like, and then Stephen Williams is like, you never know when Nosferatu is going to come over. <laughs> Which made this much better. Oh, yeah. Well, they do trap the Reaper. And he's like, uh, yeah, uh, it's the first time someone's pulled something like this on him while unconscious. So he's kind of impressed. But also he's like, like, I'm trying to help. Death's not going to stop. I'm, you're going to get pinned. You're going to get stuck here if you don't come with me. So basically Bobby's going to be stuck as like a weird ghost in his own head for eternity if he doesn't go with the Reaper. Is that is that what I'm gathering? Uh, I mean, kind of. We'll, we'll, we'll get to it. We'll, we'll circle back to that. Okay. I think it, well, things are getting. He explained the Reaper explains that the reason the things have been going like when the scenery went black in the background, or like a drawer was empty, or things disappearing, that that's his the bullet killing his brain, his brain cells dying and killing off memories, basically. Uh, and we see like the titles on all the books on the shelves all disappear, which is very stressful, by the way. Um. And faces and photos disappearing. It's actually, this is like where it gets like real, like this whole thing is heavy and, and hard, but I think this is where it really takes the turn where it's like, oh shit. Like it kind of takes the wind out of you a little bit. This, uh, this scene is for me at least is what happened. Yeah. And so really what's, what Rufus is worrying about is that, you know, this is how you become a ghost. Is yeah. if, you know, you're not going with your reaper, you're not doing what you're saying, but it also feels different for Bobby than it does with the other times we've had the yeah, the reaper weird. like you know when we had but this is but the reaper's in his head so that's what's weird about it too well yeah i mean it's different like you know when we had like tess and that creepy child um right. and you know that was in like an alternate dimension right and so that was yeah. basically like the reaper and them like living on like this different plane and here yeah. this sort of happening but it's bobby's head so I don't know. Yeah. Never going into the multiverse type shit. I mean, whatever. Um, so, but the, the lesson is, is like, if you don't watch Barney Miller, you don't die. That's what it says in my notes. Um, so, okay. So we get through. Well, because, because he's like, yeah. because the Reaper tells 
Bobby that he made a difference. You helped in the world. You have were handed you had it you were handed an unremarkable life and you made something of it, but you've done a fucking enough and you need to come with me and let it go now. But Bobby's like, Nope, I gotta see my boys. Only way out is through. And little kid Bobby shows up again. So creepy kid Bobby. Uh, yeah so we go back to young bobby and then there's drunk dad and then they fight and but then older bobby stands up to his dad and this is very like Bleh, like for me right now and i'm just like no like and there's like all emotions and shit and so then he tells him that he adopted two boys and they grew up great and they grew up heroes yeah so you can go to hell Mm. <sighs> it was so so emotional and we go back from that to the hospital and the nurse is telling them that there's since bobby is showing signs of responsiveness they're going to take him up to surgery so they need to go visit him now and we cut back to this awful kitchen scene where bobby's mom is crying dad's pissed and young little kid bobby shows up with a rifle nope don't like this at all. Nope. Hate it. Hate it a lot. I hate it so much. I hate this for Bobby. And dad laughs at him and uh, grabs mom by her hair. And dad's like, you're, you're not going to do anything with that. Oh, little kid Bobby shoots dad in the fucking head. Yeah. Okay. And it's really awful. And you, I, in order to cut the all the dark, depressing things that that means for Bobby, uh, Stephen Williams said that looks like he's, you know, like most of the characters in the show are homicidal maniacs. And then Jim Beaver replied with, "Well, we draw from life." Well, <laughs> okay. So I'm cutting this, through that, cutting through like what just happened. That, 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 it's awful. Yes. No, I appreciate that. There, the only two things I do want to bring out of it that, that what kind of. One, well, this is where mom tells him that God is going to punish you. And so that's where that quote came from. Yep. So, and then Bobby is able to tell little kid self that you did what you had to do. People almost never say thank you. Now go bury him behind the woodshed. What? What the fuck? This, so little, this so is, Bobby this is, killed and killed and buried his own dad. Bobby, that's what I was cutting through. Bobby killed and buried his own father is that not the darkest shit ever like because i do like yeah yeah no the reaper shows up with another smart narky comment i do enjoy this comment this is really great the only genetic case (laughs) of a bullet in a brain it's very clever is that is fucking clever way to go sarah i'm assuming sarah gamble and ryer way to go in that and and i and you'll know like if you want to get more but it looks like approximately where the bullet hole is is very similar right yeah so it's all very pro like slightly offset like left what would be your left eye but slightly above left eye like it's it's wild yeah well well thought out i say it's not like a like it's a surprise i mean obviously somebody wrote it but uh so back in the hospital sam and dean are with bobby and, yeah, so also Bobby's gone through the bright light again, right? So again, we have this happening again. again. Yeah. And um, so once again, I learned that and we've discussed this in other episodes that Jared Padalecki likes to fuck with Jim Beaver's toes and was twisting his toes as he was on this hospital gurney. Yeah. And he said in the scene before this, he almost broke his big toe off. Well, because he's trying to make him break as, like, oh. you know, as an actor, as he's, like, doing, like, especially while he's trying to pretend he's in a coma. And yeah. so Padalecki is down there being like, hey, hey. This little piggy went to market. Um, anyways, so they're, they're trying to talk. They're kind of talking to him, kind of not. He's still in a coma. And then Bobby wakes up. Pulls off his oxygen mask. And Dean's like, don't even try to talk because he's struggling. And gets him a pen. And Bobby writes in a Sharpie on Sam's hand the number. And uh, he's just breathing real heavy. And then he calls them idiots, like he does. And then he smiles. And then he fucking dies. Are you shitting me? I told you it was bad. (laughs) So we cut back to Bobby in the kitchen getting the beers from the fridge. And the Reaper's there and compliments him on waking up. Um, And explains that this house is his last island. Um, Everything's gone. It's your last chance to move on. You got to let it go. 
and says they'll be okay without you. No. Oh. And Bobby asks if this is, this says last memory, huh? Glad I saved the best for last. I'm going to cry talking about it. And it's back to the scene. It's back to the scene with Sam and Dean bickering over the movies um, about Chuck Norris and Jet Li and eating popcorn and talking about snacks. And then Bobby just watches them argue. And as they fade away. Yep. That's, that's it. It ends. It ends. It ends. I think one important thing, though, like, I know, like, in this, like, I end up being Team Sam because Dean wants to know within the snacks if they got licorice. And Sam is like, no, we didn't get licorice. We got good snacks. Licorice is disgusting. And that licorice what? tastes like it's made of dirt. And I agree. Except I think that licorice tastes like ass, ass mixed with something. I don't know. Like, I think it's weird that you talk about licorice as a traditional movie snack. Like Twizzlers, Twizzlers traditional is what movie I meant. snack. Red vine Twizzlers, which do not taste like licorice. They taste like right. something else. And they are like, I know they call them a licorice, but everybody knows they're not really they're licorice. They're not licorice because but... if they were real licorice, I'd be vomiting. No, it's just fucking red sugar. But anyways, um, so um, Jim Beaver said, like, it's as horrible as this was before we get to uh, Casting Couch. Um, like, one of the things he said in the commentary was just that, you know, this episode was a real honor to d- get to do. Character actors don't often get a banquet like this to feast on. So, I mean, as, like, this is, like, Emmy award-winning type shit, right? Yeah, and it's excellent. It's excellently written, excellently acted, excellently directed. But I'm just saying you're excellently wrong. But, you know, it was... Anyways, let's, we'll get back to that. Let's get to Casting Couch. Casting Couch is the Casting Couch Were they on that show that time with that guy? La 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 Okay, so Casting Couch, our Reaper is played by Henry Lubati. He's been in single episodes of shows like X-Files, Angel, 24, House, CSI, Bones. Um, he was in a couple episodes of Grimm, uh, Once Upon a Time, and The Oroville. He was Vlad in uh, one of the Big Mama movies and uh, played um, Nigel Beckford in True Blood. Nigel! That's a reoccurring character. Then no, our- Nigel was, oh my God, I forgot. Nigel was bad. Nigel was, the, uh, remember Jessica? Mm-hmm. Like he was the one that no, it wasn't Jessica. He, had, he was like, wasn't he the French vampire that had like someone tied up as like in the? I don't, I don't know. know. I think it was bad. I'll have to look at it. And then Ed Singer, dad, was played by Edward Foy. Uh, he was in a couple episodes of Fringe, a couple episodes of Once Upon a Time, and of Charm. Um, not a huge casting character. I thought it was interesting because it seemed. And that was, I know he wasn't in a lot, but it seemed like a decent actor. And he looked familiar, but I was surprised. Uh, Mom, which is what they called her, was played by Chella Horsdell. And she has quite the repertoire uh, that she, of things she's been in. Um, single episode of Smallville, but she was an assistant DA in The Exorcism of Emily Rose. She was a minivan mom in X-Men The Last Stand. She has a handful of episodes of Stargate SG-1. Um, she was, uh, uh, Daisy in, um, uh, or I'm sorry, Darcy in Alien versus Predator Requiem. She was regular character on Star Trek Discovery and Firefly Lane. Uh, she played Dr. Shelley, uh, Sussman in the movie Noel, the Christmas movie. She was, uh, a regular, an ongoing character, not regular, ongoing character named Sally in The L Word, who was also a psychic. Uh, she was Arena in, uh, in Rise of the Planet of the Apes. She was Demo Girl, so a smaller role, but in Cabin in the Woods. She was Kate as a reoccurring character in Arrow. And she was Maggie, which was a regular character in the TV show Hell on Wheels. Very cool. And just was a phenomenal actress. Like, yeah. she did was just, oh, she was amazing. Um, so, so this episode, again, just some other things in the commentary I thought they pointed out that was really good. Um so the things they brought up was that, you know, uh, Beaver brought up, you know, that Rufus was Bobby's mentor, right? The, the one who kind of right. taught him, like, how to hunt. And so Beaver thinks that, you know, thought it was really fitting that he was the one who he turned to for help. Yeah. And so sense. I do enjoy, like, really, I love Bobby and Rufus together. I just, like, yeah. anytime I get to see, even for this 
as dark as it was, like that, they, it's a happy emotion spark. Like the, that that duo together, they're just really great. Um, yeah, I agree. Also, Jim Beaver said at the end of of this shoot that he was just so very drained after like having to go through all this dark stuff, which oh, just sure. like. I mean, this is like some serious actor draws. Yeah. But he also said that it was one of Jared and Jensen's favorite episodes because of all the days they had off. So, uh. Uh, but so just, honestly, if you get a chance, like find the DVDs, like find that stuff, like go watch the commentary. And like, it was just, you know, like I said, like it cut through, like for someone who has seen this many times before, um, I, I did not want to rewatch this. Like my dad died this yeah. year. I didn't want to watch another like father. Like this is yeah. like, and they, there's so much about this. They, they brought up that like, one of the things that the Beaver points out that you know, he thought was great was like how the emphasis on you know like I adopted these boys like yeah even if it was a like in name like these are my kids these are my boys and like to yes. really and to watch the scenes in the hospital of them like oh yeah Oof. yeah I know yeah it was you know it was a very emotional very like yeah it's. An amazing episode that I never want to watch again. I agree. <laughs> Agreed. Agreed. Uh, so next week's episode, I think you know, it's we'll get some relief. It's not you know, obviously we got to deal with the aftermath of this, so it's not going to be peaches and creams, but it's not going to be mm. this. You hit, it's only you, gonna be part way. It's not. We're not like we're, swim, we're past you, the bounds of bummer. You can swim right through now. to the other side, Diana. You're not. You're okay. not gonna drown in sad. That's good. I so. appreciate that. Uh, anything else you want to say oh. about this episode? Nothing. <laughs> yeah, done. No. It. All right. Well, with that, cheers, jerk. <laughs> cheers, bitch. Devil's Trap Podcast is a Don't Get It production. Meow. Devil's Trap Podcast is part of the Ship It Studios Podcast Network. Thanks for listening to this week's episode of Devil's Trap Podcast. You can follow us on Instagram at Devil's Trap Podcast, Twitter at Devil's Trap Pod, or you can email us at Devil's Trap at Devil's Trap Podcast.com. Don't forget to subscribe, leave reviews, and share with all your friends. We're at all your favorite podcast outlets and at Devil's Trap Podcast.com. I'm Babe. Thanks for tuning in, and we'll see you next time.